and welcome to another treatment of the International Sunday School lesson. Today's lesson is entitled, Called for the World's Beliefs. And it's taken from John the 17th chapter, verses 14 through 24, and it's for the winter quarter, lesson number 8. Now, a little background information. Today's lesson is is on a prayer that the Lord offered up in the book of John. And it is a prayer for mainly his disciples to hear and as instruction for the apostles. They were in his presence when he was praying this prayer. And a lot of the wording he was saying was a lot of was for a main portion of their benefit. Also, too, if we read the scriptures very carefully, and we will notice that uh, it appears that Jesus was actually walking down the road and lifted up his eyes up into heaven and started praying, which tells us that a lot of times we can pray and not be kneeling down or praying silently or in any particular type of posture. Now, we note in the Bible there are many times where different postures are indicated from our, for people's prayers. Okay? Now, John 17, 14 through 15, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not for you to take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now, there's a lot packed into these two verses. For one thing, is that we're not of the world. It's like the Bible says in other places where our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is not here on this earth. Also, too, the devil is out to get us. And that's what Jesus is making note of in this prayer. The evil one is seeking to destroy them. And also, too, and this is, this is important, too, uh, Jesus is pointing out that he's not praying that God take them out of the world, that the Father doesn't uh, take them out of the world, but he keeps them separate from the world. Now, there are times where people will uh, try to act like we should not have any type of interaction with the people around us, with the world around us, and that's not the case. We are supposed to have some interaction with the people around us, work beside them on jobs, to be in the community with them, beside them, and show them what a Christian should be like what a saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost life is supposed to look like. Okay? Now, John seventeen sixteen and 17, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. Now, this, these are some of the two most important verses in the Bible. 
if you want to uh, hinge all of the things that a Christian life should be, this is what you could hinge it on. Looking at the Word of God. Using the Word of God to cleanse our life, to sanctify our life. The psalmist said it too. Psalms 19, 7 through 8. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statue of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now let me tell you something. It is impossible to live a good godly life without ever hearing or reading the Word of God. Now it may possibly be that you, that you may not be able to read or write, but you can at least hear people read the Word of God to you. And we need to really focus on that daily study, daily listening, daily hearing the Word of God. Because that is the way that we see our life sanctified and modified and changed is by reading and studying and adhering to the Word of God. Okay? Now, John 17, 18, and 19. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Now here we have where Jesus is talking about how he sends us into the world to tell them about the saving grace of the, his work on the cross. And Jesus has made missionaries and evangelists out of each and every one of us. We all have a place in telling the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The book of Matthew ends with the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And we see here how that Jesus gave the church the Great Commission. And it's much more than just getting people to come up to the front of the church and sign a little membership card. There's much more to being a disciple than just that. See, Jesus called us to preach the life changing gospel. He called us to make disciples. Now, a disciple is somebody who follows somebody else. We're to make disciples out of the people who accept Jesus and we win to the Lord. It is much more than just, uh, like I said, signing a card and giving a little two-minute speech. This is uh, quit you drinking, quit you smoking, quit you cussing, quit you running around on your mate, quit your uh, smacking people out of anger. Quit all of this and have a completely different life. 
That is what God called us to do, to make disciples out of the world, the people that we come in contact with. Now, this does not mean to uh, enact public laws, governmental laws, and make people adhere to a principle because they are adhering to a law. That's not what making disciples is. Making disciples is getting people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and getting those lives changed. It has got nothing to do with passing a law or a legislation. It has got everything to do with getting into people's lives, what they are like at the dinner table, what they're like around their spouse, what they're like around their children, what they're like around their parents, what they're like around their co-workers. That's what making disciples is all about. It is about changing people on the from the inside, working their way, its way to the outside. Okay. Now, John seventeen twenty and twenty one. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as just as you are one in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Being one in the Spirit. The church is not called to be this divisive thing where, uh, and it's also not called to be this thing that you're only going to church with people who look like you, who vote like you, who work in the same kind of job as you work in. That's not what the church is called to be. The church is called to be people who are saved and from all walks of life, all types of people, And we're called to be this one body of Christ. And things that trigger division. Now, I'm not talking about somebody come up with some kind of heretical uh, bad doctrine or they come up with something that says that people can go live any way they want to or or condoning some big old sin that, that I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about um uh people need to be focusing in on the fundamental truths And we need to be banded together and bonded together as we're preaching those fundamental truths. I think one of the greatest uh, uh, set of uh, books that has been, English set of books on Christianity that's ever been published was the fundamentals that were, uh, the series called The Fundamentals that some rich folks got together and funded and sent out to all and printed on the, at their own expense and sent it out to a lot of the uh, ministers of the day uh, in the early 1900s and it outlined what are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And these are the things that are important in the Christian faith. And this is what we need to be focused on because they saw at the time where the church was getting uh, very divisive. For on one hand, it was getting very divisive for political reasons. 
and various uh, political movements were offshooting from the church. And the church was getting so involved in these political movements that it was tearing the church up and it was uh, uh, desecrating uh, the message and, and what have you. And there was also a group that were l very theologically unsound who didn't really believe the Bible and were still wanting to draw a salary uh, for being ministers and they were doing enormous damage uh, to the preaching and to the message of the church. And so this was to combat uh, those two, those two, two movements. And if you get a chance to read the fundamentals, I would highly, encur highly encourage you to read that series. You know, Paul was dealing with some of the s same kind of things in 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. See, that's one of the things that was so really cool, really great about that series, The Fundamentals. It did not go off into these offshoots. They are uh, various things that we can disagree on. I can have one opinion about uh, about how revelations needs to be interpreted. You can have another opinion about how revelations can be interpreted. And we're both going to heaven. And when it's all said and done, we'll find out which how much of it either one of us was wrong about. Because we're probably both a little bit wrong about some of it. Okay, because there's nobody who's right about everything, <laughs> no matter what we may think. Uh, so the minor points, we need to uh, just kind of let go of and not make that big of a deal out of and not split off and, and have these big, huge arguments over. Now, the stuff that is not related to the Bible at all like, for example, politics, or w what kind of music we should have, or what color the carpet should be inside the church. We need to shut up and leave that stuff out of the church. That's just all they are to it. It has got no business whatsoever in the pulpit we need to be preaching how people can be saved. We need to be preaching the power of God. We need to be preaching holiness. We need to be preaching of the importance of prayer, daily prayer, having a daily prayer life. We need to be preaching the importance of having a daily devotion life, of uh, the daily reading the Bible and studying the scripture. That's what we need to be preaching behind our pulpits. This business about preaching what kind of music people need to listen to and this business of preaching about uh, who we should vote for and the garbage that's going on now is this stuff that the devil has let creep into the church to obscure the soul-saving uh, gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, John seventeen twenty two through 24. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that I sent, that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Father, I want those who you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Now, there is an enormous amount bound up in those three verses. Uh, first off, we need to be completely settled in our mind of who Jesus is. 
Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Before the creation of the universe, there Jesus was. And that's one thing. Uh, he wasn't just a he wasn't a good just a good teacher. He wasn't just a uh, reformer. He wasn't just a kind-hearted person. He wasn't just somebody who had uh, uh, some of the spirit and worked some miracles. He wasn't just a good prophet. He was and is the only begotten firstborn, the only begotten Son of God. He is uniquely different than anyone else who has ever lived on the face of this planet. Uniquely different because he is a member of the Trinity. And that makes him uniquely different. The other thing that we need to be uh, focused in on is that the reward for our life is to be with Jesus. When we leave here, we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a reward someday. We may struggle and strive down here. And it may look like the evil people may be getting the good end of the deal to where they can get away with stuff that we can't get away with. But there is a payday coming someday. And we will be with Jesus. Okay? Now, some concluding thoughts to all of this. First off, I, I don't care how wound up we get with the day-to-day -day activities. And I'm not saying we shouldn't care about things. Uh, I make sure uh, every opportunity I get that I vote. I, if I believe in something, I will write checks to politicians and contribute to politicians if I believe that they're going to go in and do the right thing. If I am called, I've still served on juries uh, three different times during my adult life. And I believe Christians should do that. I give all kinds of of honor and respect for people who serve as firemen, who serve as policemen, who serve in the military, uh, and these kind of things. I think those are very honorable. I believe that we should give them all the respect in the world because of what they're doing. And society needs that. They are doing a, a extremely valuable service to the society. However, any of that, all of that, needs to be kept out of the church. The church, from everything that you can tell from the, this prayer that the Lord Jesus was praying, the purpose of the church is to preach the soul-saving gospel, the life-changing gospel. That is the only purpose of the church. And when we deviate from that, and when the world comes in and they usurp the things in the church to make the church do something other than preaching salvation in ministering to people, then it's of the devil. And you'll almost always see when that begins to happen where you start having factions and arguments and disruption inside the church. If you bring what style music 
people should be playing and listening to. Inside the church, you alienate some people inside the church and put a hindrance over something silly as what kind of music they listen to. If you bring politics inside the church and alienate people over politics, you alienate those people and open them up for the devil to have control of their life. Shame on anyone who brings the world divisive things from the world inside the house of God. The house of God is for preaching the gospel and discipling people for change in their personal life. Well, friends, good Lord willing, I'll be back with you next weekend.